Hello and welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, kind of a special edition of the Pick 6 Podcast. we got the heavy hitters in here, Dirk Chatlin and Tom Chattel. I'm Sam McEwen. This week, Evan is uh, on assignment uh, talking to Mickey Joseph at practice, and Jimmy is out. He is, he's, he's, uh, back. he's going back home for a wedding, uh, so he will return uh, next week. Uh, so this week we have special guest Tom Chattel, who I think you're going to make this a more weekly, uh, like regular appearance. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to be on, on the show more often, and Dirk, we'll see. <laughs> I, I'd like to have you here every single week, but uh, we'll get into the conversation. We're going to talk, Trev Alberts talking to the Big Red Breakfast today. He said some really interesting things about the coaching search, uh, and Dirk did about a 45-minute Q&A with him. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, specific coaches and why those guys might be fits, including one, Dave Aranda. We're going to talk directly about him uh, and, and some interesting things about him. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit in Nebraska basketball and whether these two guys who know way more about basketball and invested way more time in writing about Nebraska basketball than I ever have or will, if they're buying this new Fred Hoiberg, uh, you know, the play ugly, uh, we're just going to run an open practice, we're not going to have much fun, we're just going to try to be tough, whether they're buying that or selling that. But I want to remind everybody as we start the podcast, you know what, we, you can actually subscribe to the Omaha World Herald. Some of you folks are listening to this either on Apple Podcasts or YouTube Podcasts, and so we want to remind everybody that you can, you too, can be an Omaha World Herald subscriber. Some of the people listening already are, and we thank you for that. But if you're not and you want to get all of the Husker coverage uh, for, uh, well, the foreseeable future, all the coaching search stuff, all the Nebraska basketball stuff, um, everything that's going to be going on with the transfer portal, and trust me, it's going to be busy. You're going to want to go to omaha.com backslash subscribe. That's omaha.com backslash subscribe. You can get all of your Husker coverage there, and we would love to have you as a digital subscriber. Okay, let's go to Trev Alberts um, from uh, from earlier today. It was a very good Q and A that you did. He was he was probably about as transparent as I thought he was going to be. I didn't. I thought I was worried he was going to shut down some of these questions, but I thought he was actually pretty good. Um, and you kind of got into some of the questions related to how do you go about this search process. He admitted, Dirk, that he, he talks to coaches that he's not going to hire, um, coaches who he just talks to because he respects. And then you asked the big question about, about development and that Nebraska used to be, and I think we all can at this table can agree, the premier development program in college football. He meant he went through his own sort of process there of how he was recruited, um, and he made the comment that Nebraska needs to be the premier development program in the Midwest, if not in all of college football, and that that Nebraska has gotten away from that over the last 20 years. He also said, (laughs) he also said at one point, there are times where he wanted to say, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And resisted the urge to do that because that's not what an AD does. Uh, And and that was in particular reference to, I think, some of their practice regimens. So... Uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. It was it was uh, he was a little bit more pinpoint on some of the the frost things than I thought he was going to be. Um, the tackling and practice thing I thought was really interesting. Um, but as you noted, Sam, he uh, you know I, I think he comes from the old school of Nebraska's got to be a fundamental football power, and I know Tom Chattel subscribes to that theory. I know I subscribe to that theory. Uh, and for whatever reason, Scott Frost did not really shine in that area. Uh, Nebraska's, I think, recruiting, they were fine. The guys they were bringing on campus, you know, generally were were capable of at least winning seven, eight, nine games. But but what Nebraska got out of those guys was, was frankly, pretty embarrassing. And, and we're uh, seeing that now with these are all of Frost recruits on defense, and we're seeing. Well, and, and his, best play, his best players are mercenaries, right? Yeah. Like they just they showed up in the last six months. So it's like where, where was all the talent development? Uh, and and Trev Alberts knows that. And I think I get the sense that I, I think you guys do too, that, that he is, he's very interested in a program builder uh, who, you know, he referenced today somebody who knows how to build the apparatus, you know, which if you believe in, in that Nebraska football was sort of an old machine, which, again, I think that that's true. Uh, Alberts, I think, wants to – he wants to build a machine, not just a program that, you know, is is patching holes every six months or, 
you know, recruiting the, the portal every six months, but I think he wants a program that, that is sustainable. And to do that, you've got to find a coach, a head coach, who really knows how to develop talent. Uh, and I thought that was a partic- particular point of interest. This Let's morning. just put Bill Snyder back in the time machine and go back 20 years. Yeah. Let's get a 65 year old Bill Snyder. That would be good. Well, yeah, there's only one of those, but, <laughs> right. there, but there might be some guys who are in that, that similar vein. Um, you know, I'm, I'll say one thing about Frost. You know, all the coaching greats he was around his whole career, his whole life, played for him, coached with him, you know, and he chose Chip Kelly to be his his guy. Yeah. And that's what he brought to Nebraska. And the – I mean, you know, I, I don't want to press Mickey on this because he wasn't in charge, but – after Oklahoma, well, we got to go back to the what do they call them? Live drills or fundamentals? Uh, fun, yeah, yeah, fundamentals. What the hell were they doing last spring? <laughs> I mean, you have fifteen. You only get fifteen practices. What are you doing? And what are you doing in August? What are you doing? If you got to do this now, what were they doing? So, um, sure, uh, we don't get to see practice, so we don't get to see that, but. Holy cow. I mean, to go back to the basics now, that says something. So, but of course, we see it when it's probably seen it in the game. So, um, there's a line in one of my, one of my favorite movies, The, the, uh, the Fugitive. Uh, Harrison Ford, great movie, um, where he tells uh, Tommy Lee Jones, I'm trying to put together a puzzle, and I just found a big piece. Mm-hmm. And then he, he puts the phone down. Um, I thought Trev Alberts today gave everybody a big, a big hint. Uh, this is if, if you're trying to find a clue, he gave you one today. Developmental. I want to be the top developmental program in the country. Who does that point to? Well, it it doesn't point to Eric Bieniemy. Um, I got a call yesterday. Hey, I heard Eric Bieniemy uh, uh, interviewed w- 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 with uh, Alberts uh, the, the the Friday after the. The Chiefs Thursday night game, which would have been the Friday before OU. And I immediately thought, well, maybe he was up here scouting because there are some NFL players on the field. Um, and so I mean, just Trevor Alberts talking to him, like, just, uh, hey, you're in town? Let me, let me pick your brain. That was my thought. Eric Benepi is not going to do – he's not – it's not developed anything. Well, he's an offensive coordinator in the NFL. He yeah. wants an NFL job. And, and he's with Andy Reid and Patrick yeah. Mahomes. So – doesn't mean he won't be a head he coach. He deserves an day. NFL job. That's right. what he deserves. But, I mean, <laughs> but this is what I feel like, you know, uh, today Dirk spent time talking to Trev. Are you, are you a candidate? Because whoever apparently Trev talks to is a candidate. I am a candidate, Tom. So, I just want to make that clear. I would like to see I would uh, like, I'd to, like see to see a Dirk football team. I submitted my <laughs> application. Going back to the power eye. But I, I think today was a major clue. People need to focus, you know, follow the clues. Today was a big one. Developmental. Now, who is that? We don't know. Diamond in the rough. Another another key phrase. Maybe someone who sees Nebraska as a diamond in the rough. Maybe somebody who himself is a diamond in the rough as well. Yeah, Maybe, I don't. You know what I mean? It isn't mm-hmm. not going to be a big name. I don't think it's going to be a big. Aranda. Okay. I'm, we'll talk about I, him in a minute. I, I, I think it could be. I, I, you never rule anybody out, no matter yeah. what they say. But it's going to be that kind of person. Yeah, I I don't want to sell Nebraska short. Um, I think that, you know, with as much money as Nebraska is going to throw at their next head coach, there's probably, <laughs> outside of the top, maybe 20 coaches in the country, I think Nebraska would would get a phone call from, or would, would uh, any coach would accept a phone call outside of that, prop, probably that top 15, 20 guys, based on the just the sheer salary that Nebraska is going to throw at somebody. Right. But I do agree that I think, Nebraska and Trev Alberts is in the mood for um, sort of a, you know, a, a grinder who's going to, you know, a Lance Leipold type guy, you know, somebody who who knows knows the environment, um, knows what it's sort of like to do it the old school way. And I don't think that means that Nebraska is going to look old school, but I think it's just the, the, okay. re, the recommitment to – a, a really firm foundation uh, because the program for a long time now um, has just lacked a foundation. There's just not been any continuity in terms of 
uh, you know, what they do. It's every year is, is sort of like, like I said, trying to patch holes. And uh, I don't think Trev's in the mood for that. I think he wants somebody who's going to slowly build this thing and, and get a little bit better every year, a little bit better every year, bringing in seven transfers instead of 20. You know, I think it's, uh, I think it's most likely going to be uh, someone with substance over style if you had to choose. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, I mean, I totally agree. It's gonna be some, it's gonna be something lasting. This is not this is not a quick fix. It's it's 1962 all over again next year. It really is. Uh, it doesn't mean you're you're gonna get the the Bob Devaney program, but it's start from the bottom. Now, Devaney also inherited a lot of good players. The guy a next year, team. yes, he, the, he the next year will not be like that. He did. I, th- I think a lot of this team is going to leave. Um, and so I, I, I don't. You have to bring in. It, it's it, may, it might be rough next year, but if you have a you know, but, but as we've seen with the uh, uh, you know landslide pole or whatever, you can make progress the first year too. You can really be, you know, I make a lot of progress. It doesn't mean they can't win, but it's going to be okay. Here's how you block. Here's how you tackle. Mm-hmm. Now let's do that over and over. If I Nebraska just... goes five and seven this season, I think that fewer, far fewer players could leave. Because I think if you if you can get to a record where the kids say, "All right, we're going to bring another head coach in here. We didn't go to a bowl game, but, but we're not terrible." But if they go one and eleven, and I'm telling everybody that if they don't win on Saturday and they don't beat Rutgers, I agree. There's a good chance they go one and eleven. The thing that Scott Frost didn't have to deal with when he took over Central Florida when they went zero and twelve is fifty guys leaving because those guys would have had to had to sit out somewhere else. At Nebraska, with a transfer portal as it is right now, right. as it is right now, so many guys could leave that you could have what Tom Crean inherited at Indiana basketball, playing walk, playing three walk-ons in the starting lineup. It yeah. could be really, really rough. And so, Roy Williams, 1989. These oh, games, yeah. these games matter in that sense because I, I, I think, I think we've got to put way on the back burner Mickey Joseph being the head coach. We focused quite a bit on him so far, and that's fine. But I think it's more about what's set up for the next guy as it relates to the program builder. And I'm not saying that this guy is a candidate because he isn't. PJ Fleck is an example of a person who completely rebranded Minnesota football. So he has his TV show in his practice facility, and what strikes you about what's behind him in the in his TV show is every single slogan that he has is written on the walls of the practice facility. He's got like six. <laughs> now, the reason he isn't a candidate for this job is because you can't do that here. Just like Trev said today, and Dirk asked the question about tradition. So there is this idea that Nebraska football has all these historical truths that the next coach cannot be intimidated by. He said that. Yeah. The right guy won't be intimidated by the tradition simultaneously they have to build it in their own. This is not easy. It's not easy to be able to say, well, we've got to incorporate all these things that used to be true about Nebraska football while rebuilding it in our own way. And like P.J. Fleck couldn't do it. P.J. would come here and go, well, look, I, okay, this tradition over here is what it is, but I'm going to put o- ORs on the walls and I'm going to put W-I-N and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say you know, the slogan and I'm going to do this. We're going to talk about boring habits and... It's like an entire. It's like a. It's like a. Uh, you know, business executive program that PJ Flex is running. So the challenge, I think, one of them is that you've got to get a guy in here who's actually comfortable with all of the. The BS is the wrong word, but like all of the stuff that comes along with this job, and of the last four coaches they've had, only one was, and they got rid of him faster than everybody else. Mike Riley was willing to deal with all that, and they they ran him out like they overwhelmed him. And so I think there's a challenge in who are you going to get to come in here who's going to carry on the traditions um, but simultaneously do their own thing. Now, they have to modernize, and it's really, really hard for an old, an old uh, institution uh, that's been through two lost decades to, to suddenly figure out the solution of modernization. Uh, the thing that I would, you know, I'm probably robbing a, of a future column here for one of us, but the thing that I would like to see and I'm not saying I want to see Nebraska go two and ten or three and nine next year, but like I think we have to get out of this mindset of if everybody leaves, that's really bad because what are they going to do? They'd have to start from scrap. Okay, 
It's yeah. okay to start from scrap. That's like, what they're going to do. It's okay to start from scrap. <laughs> it's, it's okay to suck in the first year of, and, of a monumental rebuild. Like, at some point, Nebraska has to embrace that. At some point, Nebraska has to sort of lean into the underdog thing. And they, they've never done they it. They can't do it. They, it's so hard. They've never done it. Like, think about it. Every coaching change, right? Callahan couldn't do it. They were coming off a 10-3. and three. Polini, they had too much talent, and there was too much, uh, you know, too and much. And he did okay. Too much starving to do he that. Okay. But 2008 was probably the closest time Nebraska's ever had to that. Right. Riley never had that because, again, you're coming off a 9-3, and 9-4. And, and Frost never had it because the hype was too high, and he was and coming he off it. of Central Florida. He and he fed, fed it. it. Like he said, in year two, we're gonna be we're gonna be serious. You know, it's like at some point, if Nebraska is going to be a program that hasn't won anything or been to a bowl game for six years, they have to embrace the fact that we that we're gonna build it slowly and we're gonna build it solidly and we're not gonna do the quick fix thing. And part of that is, hey man, if we lose a freshman receiver who came because of Scott Frost, we lose him. I'm All saying right. they could what lose Casey okay. Thompson. Of course. And Chubba Purdy. And you know what? Maybe they should. Maybe they <laughs> should, Sam. Maybe yeah. the next head coach should should start over and, right. and find his own guy. In the what same way that, that means, Scott did. What if that means not having black shirts anymore? What does I, the black shirts mean right now? They don't now? have black shirts right now. What does it mean? What does that thing mean? It, it means losing as much as it means winning. It, it means you're not tackling in practice. You're wearing a black shirt, you're not tackling in practice. Right. So what does it mean? What if what if the next guy what if the next guy comes in and says, you know what, the tunnel walk thing, that's not how I wanna that's, <laughs> No, I'm just saying, like Absolutely. And, granted, and and that's that's a a cosmetic thing. Yeah. But but there are moments like that where Nebraska fans are gonna have to say, How much do we really trust this? You know, mm-hmm. how much how much does starting over actually mean what, starting over? I think uh, and I, I would lean toward, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna start over and it, embrace it, you know, be be the underdog for once. I think people embrace winning and doing it the right way. That's what they're going to do. But this is an interesting quote. Uh, I, I, I remember seeing this last year. Kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit. Uh, Jamie Pollard, the Iowa State AD, yeah, talking about Matt Campbell, right? And apparently they may not get along great. I don't know, but uh, he said, well. You know, his name is being mentioned for all these jobs. Well, we'll see him go somewhere else and and see if he can get him to wear all black. He can, he, he can do that here, but you can't do that everywhere else. He said that was a quote. So he was like challenging Matt Campbell to go somewhere else and see if he can get him to wear black, you know, change the color to black. But that's an example of, of what you said about Fleck. You know, Matt Campbell's gone to Iowa State and changed their identity. Scott Scott leaned all the way into the tradition yeah. because he had to, right? Because of what he, he didn't have a choice. That yeah. was part of the problem. Um, and you know, he he, I think he leaned into it without <laughs> without quite understanding the challenge in front of him. That's right. Uh, but but he, he forgot the most important tradition: how you play. Right. But y- you got to find somebody who who really has a vision for what modernization at an old football power looks like. Yeah. And I don't know if Trev has that vision. It's hard to find that vision. I don't have that vision. Um, I can throw ideas at the wall, but I think it's real. I think they're willing to be flexible on the concept of walk-ons. I think they're willing to be flexible. I know that they are willing to be flexible about things that Scott felt like he had to carry on. Um, when Scott got here, they signed 23, 24 walk-ons, some, some obscene number of walk-ons, um, and then they did it again. And I think there was a sense of, like, we need to we, – when we got back here, we need to have 150 players on this roster, and that's just not accurate. Yeah, you and I disagree a little bit on the value of that. But. I, know, I understand that. <laughs> but what I would say is that I think the current – Nebraska's current administration is, let's go get 40 walk-ons that we can give Alston money to and – you know, help with NIL, and let's stop worrying about having the, again, extra 30 walk-ons just there for multiple practice stations. Yeah. Like, there's a difference between a 120-man roster, which is 40 walk-ons, and 150. And so I think they're willing to be flexible there. I don't know about the black shirts. I do feel like the question you asked about tradition, I don't know that, that Trev has an answer for that yet, because I think 
fundamentally, Trev is a disruptor. He is less interested in keeping things the same way for sure than many people are. And so I think he has to walk a tightrope between, because I think if you were to say, listen, if, if PJ Fleck were the right guy, and I'm not, again, he's not going to be the guy, but if he were, would you let him come in and rebrand everything and do everything? I think, you know, somebody like Trev's thinking would say, if there's a candidate out there that would literally have to rebrand everything and I thought they were the right person, I would, I would do it. I just don't think that's going to be the person. I think it's going to have to be somebody who's a hybrid of like, I will accept these things, but I'm going to change these things. And oh, by the way, Trev, you will handle the former players. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of like, uh, you know, you fall in love with somebody and they say, you know what? I'm moving to Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh, Are you coming with me or not? You know, and it's Mm -hmm. like, well... I really love you, but I don't know if I want to go to Zimbabwe. That's right. There's you a lot of you, that's right. There's a lot of Nebraskans that are like that, and I think <clears throat> to turn the program around, you probably got to have a little bit more of a mentality shift of saying, "If you're the guy, I'll move to Zimbabwe." But I think also right. If, <laughs> if, I get what you're saying, but yeah. if somebody comes in and says, "We're doing all this stuff, and this is how we're doing it," and um, you know, you, you, you get people calling into the shows, the, the comments section. The people's hair, their hair will be on fire. They yeah. hate it. They hate it. They start winning. Okay, all right. Winning is like the man said today. Winning solves everything, and people will buy in if you're winning. Well, okay, I, but, okay. I'll, I'll go with that. But keep winning. Yeah, I, th- <laughs> I just think a big part of it is they bought into Bo, I, and I Bo was the, Bo was 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 really tough off the field. I like he embarrassed tr- a lot of people, but. People were like the fan base was split on Bo because he won, not because of his personality. Absolutely. People will always say and, it was because of his personality, but no, and, they were split on him because he won. Because right. most Nebraskans thought, "Yeah, I don't like this guy that much," but, well, he <laughs> but he wins. He didn't respect Nebraska tradition, right? At all, but he won, and so yeah. people are like, "Are we really going to get rid of this guy?" It wasn't like with Solich. Solich was more he's our kind of guy, and he was winning relatively it, some. Bo was like, he's really, yeah, this, yeah, I don't like this guy that much, but he wins. And then when they got rid of him and they right. got a nice guy that I think most, a lot of Nebraskans liked as a person, but he didn't win. And so, and then there were people within the infrastructure at Nebraska who, who were best buddies with Bo, and they made sure that Riley got out of here as fast as possible. But I think part of the issue is that it, it, it is that winning component. I, I, Tom, I'm sorry to jump in front. No, that's I fine. just think, I look at Arkansas. Arkansas is an underdog in the SEC, right? Former powerhouse. They're an underdog in the SEC. Yes. Ole Miss is an underdog in the SEC. They are. Former power from 60 years ago. They're an underdog. Colorado, underdog in Pac-12. Like, at some point, (laughs) Nebraska needs to feel like a program that hasn't won anything in 20 years. That's right. Like, it needs to... They need the the edge, the advantage you get mm-hmm. from. So who is that in the program? The advantage you get from lowering expectations and letting being surprised by a good season. When is the last time Nebraska was surprised? No, they're like, not. Like happily surprised. We we we, we feel the it pressure was to pick a winning season every year. It was two thousand freaking nine. Yeah, and that was like. Sort of a, a miserable walk at the midpoint of the season. Before, oh yeah, before Sue and Bo saved it. But like, it, it's so weird to be around a program that sucks so bad and yet still carries this weight. Right? Yeah. It's like watching a, it's like watching a forty-five-year-old quarterback like Tom Brady, who's you know, and Brady's not a perfect example because he just won a Super Bowl two years ago, but. It's it's like watching someone who's so terribly out of their prime that still carries the weight of feeling like they have to average twenty eight points a game. You know, it's like, what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. Like, it, the mentality has to shift. I don't know. It's what, Willie Loman. I don't know what they. I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. But Nebraska has to find a head coach who knows what that looks like. And okay, so but here's the other question: When you say Nebraska needs to needs to start acting like it hasn't won anything in twenty years, who is that? Who within Nebraska structure? Because again, uh, five years ago, uh, five years ago this week or last week, I don't know, I can't remember what weeks they are now. Five years ago last week, the the president of the university and the chancellor of the university stand up in, you know, in um, wherever that is the 
the the, play, the alumni hall after they fire um, Sean Eichhorst. They fired Sean Eichhorst. It wasn't even Mike Riley yet. And I think it was somebody from our team, it might have been you, who asked, what is the standard? What is the standard? Um, and one of them said, I don't see why we couldn't go back to the 90s. I mean... <laughs> Har- Harvey said that, right? No, Harvey was gone by then. It was it was it was Ronnie and it was Hank. Okay, I don't see why we can't go back to the '90s. And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> I mean, here we are. Like, there's it feels like there's never any room to say that you're living in a big mansion without much furniture. Yeah, you know. And so part, I think that's yeah. And part of it, I think, and Scott was never allowed to do anything other than be. And I'm not trying to make excuses for Scott Frost, but I am saying that when Scott back got back here. Where did he go first? He didn't come up and talk to us. He went, he went down it. there. And it's like those 300 guys, hey, we're your constituency. You answer to us before you answer to anybody else. It can't be like that. You, it can't be, you know, the 90s, whatever, the 80s, the 90s. It can't be about, hey, come to us and ask us how we did it so that you can know how to do it here. It, well, it just, you it, know it what, doesn't though? work. But, Sam, that had to happen. Because that had Scott had to do it that way because for twenty years, fifteen years, right. we, we all said, "What if they finally find a guy who goes back and actually tries it the old way?" It ha- somebody had to do it that way, okay? Like to a T, the way that as and it mu- failed. As much as, it failed. So it failed, okay? Yeah. So now we can wipe that clean. Now, what my point is, you can bring in Matt Rule, whatever, bring in a guy and and. And if the expectations are so high right away, if he's talking a big game, if the pressure, you know, if if a nine and three season feels like like a grind, if Urban Meyer comes back and every game is under the spotlight, I don't know how much fun that's going to be. Even if you reasonably succeed, it's not going to be Urban Meyer. I know it's not, but if <laughs> if you bring in a, an actual underdog, you know, a Lance Leipold who comes in here, I think people might actually get behind the the fact that hey, here we are, we're this up and comer, we're starting from scratch. You know, there might be some joy in the development of a program again, uh, and that hasn't happened in a what ever. Is Leipold your guy? Do you like Leipold? Well, let me ask you: What's our role in in changing the the the, the and that and that, and that, and that, and that I guess the uh, the the mindset, the, the media's role, the media's role, yeah. and and that's some particulars. But we're I th- we're we're pretty powerful in the state, and, sure. Um, um, we we tend to have we tend to have a lot of opinions, uh, whereas maybe others don't. Um, I don't think talk radio reaches that. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I'm saying, is it the the AD? Does he change the minds? Does he come out and say, "Here's how we're going to"? He's work? tried. I mean, everything Dirk just said. Who says that? And where is, it, is the head coach? He can't really come in and do that, can he? Maybe he can. I don't know. But I think I think it needs to happen. And all three of us have been saying this like in bits said, and pieces for a while, though. It's 1962 all over again. We were you. It, it, it's a blank slate. And here comes a new coach. He's got his way of doing it. Here's another way to say it. In 2013, I'll, I'll, I'll in 2013, be, I'll, I'll October 2013, this. you write a column. Do you remember the column you wrote after Nebraska lost to Minnesota? 2013. Yeah, I remember it vividly. Yeah. So Dirk wrote a column nine years ago saying he looked at all the banners around Minnesota Stadium. He says, just because it has been doesn't mean it will be. I think that's yeah. the way you wrote it. We've been talking about this for nine years. I mean, you've talked about it many times. Nebraska's not in the Big 12 anymore. They're in a completely different league. I think you've written about this many times. They, they, don't, they, have, they, they don't fit. Like, they, Here's what I'm saying, Sam. When Nebraska plays Iowa and Wisconsin, Nebraska should have the intangible emotional edge. They should now, and they don't. They don't. Well, they don't against Iowa. I don't know if they do against Wisconsin, but they don't against they don't, Iowa. You know what I mean? Iowa wants to beat Nebraska, in my That's opinion, more I'm than saying. Nebraska. They don't like how they don't asinine is that? They don't take them seriously. Because how Nebraska, asinine is Nebraska that? Nebraska football is never allowed to have a rival. They're never allowed to be emotionally attached to struggling to beat teams. They're, Nebraska football doesn't get to have a rival after Oklahoma. In, in searching for a tangible example... That's the best I can do. That's a great it, way. It, it's like That's when, when point. Nebraska plays Iowa, Nebraska should feel like the damn underdog. But you underdog. don't think Nebraska, Iowa's Nebraska's rival. But that's part of – that's what, what Tom always told us was you can't have a rival. Every game matters. If you're going to win the national championship, sure. you're pointing toward the Orange Bowl. But they did have a rival. National title. It was Oklahoma. But 
Right. Oklahoma made Nebraska. Oklahoma was better than Nebraska. Right. Oklahoma was yeah. the target. And, you and know. the problem is we can't handle, like, we. it's hard for Nebraska football players to even but say, this, more of, I, this game is bigger than any other game. They won't even do it now. Like, was, they just, you know. But I'm saying, the, and, and, that, and, and that was more into the 90s, too, when Colorado was trying to call him. Not, and uh, he wouldn't, Kansas State. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't acknowledge him. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 the lack of acknowledgement, I think, w- w- was toward, we can't have a rival because we're trying to we're trying to win them all. That's right. We're trying to win them all. I get it. And so, but Miami and Florida State made him change his defense. College football is more fun when you have a rival. Yeah, yeah. it's well, more fun. I, I'm okay with Nebraska not drawing a circle around somebody on the schedule, uh, either directly or but, privately. But, but but they won't let it happen either. They won't let it happen. They're they're still stiff arming it. What is that? I just want to try it. The, the, the next coach will, will stiff arm it too. I don't care who it is. I just want to watch a Nebraska Iowa game or Nebraska Michigan game or whatever and feel like one of these programs is walking onto the field free of expectations and, and it's, it's Nebraska. And it's Nebraska. Yeah. That's a heck of a point. Who do you, so is Leipold the guy you like? Hey, you're not, you're not hiring the coach. So we can talk about this a little bit. You know, I, you I mean, watch I, football. I think it's per, okay. I think it's going to be hard to pull. I don't know why Matt Campbell would say yes, even if he was the guy. Like, he's turned down a lot of real big-time jobs. Now, maybe the Big 12 turmoil and, you know, Nebraska's paycheck changes that. But in Aranda, that just – I don't know why. I mean, Baylor's <laughs> – We'll talk about them in a minute. Baylor's really good. Yeah. Uh, Leipold, is, he just checks a lot of boxes. You know, he's, he's sort of the anti-Frost at this point. He's not your national championship quarterback. He's an old GA. Uh, who, you know, coached at UNO and, you know, Division three and, you know, hard, hard FCS jobs uh, or lower, lower FBS, as opposed to Scott that was sort of a, you know, a nice group of five job. That's right. By comparison, Buffalo versus Orlando is a, is a pretty good contrast in, exactly. in jobs. Yeah. Um, I, I think what he's done at Kansas is, you know, if they win eight games this year at Kansas, which they, I think they might, uh, he might get national coach of the year. He might. <laughs> you imagine Nebraska hiring back to back coaches who are national coach of the year? Yeah. Uh, that could happen. So I just think from a from a player development standpoint and sort of making the most of what you have, I think Leipold is makes a pretty compelling case mm. for where the program is hurting right now. And he has enough understanding of, of the market, of the environment, where I think he would probably check a lot of the boxes from a PR standpoint. Uh, I've never spoken to him personally. Um, actually, I take that back. I did uh, when he was at Whitewater briefly, but uh, but I uh, I think he's just a you know a really really solid candidate that probably gets more exciting every game that Kansas wins. Why not Brett Bielema? Oh, he'd leave there. I mean, we all know he would. I think the uh, first of all, I think he's in a more abrasive personality, which yes. would rub some people wrong here. Yeah. Uh, I could see Brett Bielema hearing a former player on the radio complaining about practice practice access or something like that, and Brett not handling that very well. He's a well. frat guy. And I also yeah. think that, you know, the stink of the Arkansas situation was – that was pretty profound by the end. I mean, he was – that did not go well. No, I so, um I don't think Bielema is it's as – Big Ten men, though. I know. You hire yeah. a Big Ten man. <laughs> But, I, but what if there is no perfect candidate? What if no, he's, he's the best no. guy and he's got baggage, but he's the best guy? Yeah. I mean, well, I think Nebraska, if they're going to throw eight or nine million bu- bucks at somebody, which they might, I, yeah. I don't think they want somebody with baggage. <laughs> Why not? Matt, well, what about Matt Campbell? What do we think about him? I I like him. I um, I thought well, you know, last year he had his best team and he went seven and six. Um, I think he's very good. I don't know. How good? I mean, I think when he's done there, has has he kind of hit the wall? And I, and I wonder. I've heard talk from people over there that as soon as Oklahoma and, and uh, 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 Texas said that we're out, he said, "I I I I I, I don't want to be here anymore." Right. Um, so Matt Campbell gets a lot of run nationally with a lot of a lot of national reports. I love how they hit the crap out of people. That one bowl game, the Alamo Bowl. Uh, I, think they, I think they play Washington State. They beat the crap out of them. This is the hardest hitting Iowa State team I've seen since like uh, 1977 when they 
when, when they had Stensrud and, all, and lost some of those guys, they were really, really good, but they, they beat Nebraska that year. Um, I think he's he's changed the 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 the, the whole dynamic over there. Um, but would he come here? Why not? I, I think all those guys are in play. I really do. I don't think anybody's a random. I think they're all in play. You got to sell them. Trevor Alvarez has to be a great salesman. Now, it, it, if somebody says I've got money, I've got a better job. I don't have the pressure. You don't want them anyway because they have to want to embrace this. Okay, there's going to be some things. Trev, you take care of these former players. You take care of this and that. But there's going to be some headaches. You got to embrace the whole thing. Mark Stoops. Oh, absolutely. Mark Stoops. He's not coming. Over. But he Why may- not? He works at a basketball school in a league in he a division. Makes- he will never win. He will never win it ever. <laughs> you, you like- Imagine knowing you're never going to win your division I- and coaching in a school that is never going to prioritize well, your I think, team. I think he would come, but he makes eight million. I think. Okay. Fair so enough. are you going to? Uh, Trevor, uh, uh, you think Mark very- Stoops would leave Kentucky for Nebraska? Yes, I do. I do. Huh. It's Big Ten. He 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 grew up in Ohio. He played at Iowa. Yes, I do. Um, and I think the the Cal Perry thing isn't going to go away. I, th- I, I think not, they've taken very good care of him. Yeah. But he's always going to be Kentucky, and Nebraska. I had this argument yesterday with the, somebody about Dave Aranda. Well, uh, uh, he's got a better job than Nebraska. Yeah, but when Nebraska's right, it's better than Baylor. It's a lot better than. Well, Baylor. it's in a better league, and, and so. Um, uh, Kentucky or SEC, they're going to get five. See, eventually this is going to be about how many playoff bids in your league. Sure. And um, Big 12 is going to get one. Well, and the, the, the Big Ten and the SEC are, are probably going to get five, four or five. Three or four, yeah. Three yeah. or four or five. At least, at least. Yeah. And so, okay, if, 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 if you're Mark Stoops, you're in the right league, but how many times can you get in there? I think Nebraska, if, if things are going well, you can, you, you know, the, the, the name still carries with the, the, the playoff committee. You've got you to do your work. But I think it's a brand name. Brand names are always, it's always better to be a brand name than it is somewhere, unless you don't want the whole pie, the whole pressure thing. Right. Why think, not an eccentric like Lane Kiffin? Well. Why not? Uh, I mean, I think he's too much like Scott Frost. I do too. But, but why not an eccentric like but, him? Do you think Lane would take the job at his dad's old spot? I think he might. Really? His brother coached here. Yeah. See, do I think do I even think his brother and his wife would want to come back here and Lane? Yeah. Even in the, even in here. our conversation, it's funny how I catch myself like playing both sides of the fence because it's like I I genuinely Tom think that Nebraska is a super appealing job right now. Right. Like, I agree. Big money, big facilities, sure. low expect general you know relatively low expectations based on what the other coaches have walked into over 20 years, uh, an improving conference situation, all these things. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I'm like, yeah, but I don't know if Mark Stoops is going to agree with the way that I see it. You know, I don't know if Dave Aranda well, is going to agree with the way that I well, see they, it. Well, they, yeah, they may not. But um, fit, Sam, you're talking about Lane Kiffin. He's not a fit in the Big Ten. He's a good fit in the, the SEC is kind of freewheeling. It's sure. it's, it's it's offensive line and, and it's, it's a defensive line built. It goes inside out, but he, the guy's a cartoon character. He is. He's, he, he loves fine bomb, all that stuff. That works for there. I think he's more comfortable there and running his offense there. Coming here, I mean, I, look, Ole Miss won ten game. I'm not going to say that if they can't block and tackle, but. He, you know, I think when I see him, I, I kind of see Leach. I kind of see these guys that are eccentric. Does that work in the Big Ten? It's an interesting question. I, wanna, I, don't, I don't think Trev sees it that way. Yeah, I want to add something. I was talking to someone uh, who is in the coaching industry and who's been a defensive coordinator. And they made a comment to me, and this was last week, uh, that this is what they said. They really like Scott Frost as a person. They said, yeah, you know, Frost and Frost is in that family of coaches with Leach, and Riley, Kiffin. This is exactly how he said it. He's like, these guys, they're so smart, and they got their offense. And he's like, you know what? Those guys, they kind of clock out at 5 p.m. That's exactly what he said. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, they just they don't, they don't do all the little things because they're so confident their offense is going to be good, and they coach by feel. And I'm like, 
I've never heard anybody say this. And I'm like, so what you mean to say that Lane Kiffin and Scott Frost are kind of similar in that way? And he's like, yeah. He's because he, this guy had worked for some of these people. And he's like, yeah, the people who do that air raid stuff and do the spread offense stuff, he's, and he said, like, and Riley was the same way. He's like, and it was in reference to Venables. Like, Venables is completely different, and Oklahoma is going to be a different program in three years because he's going to put in all of the hours, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really notable to me. Now, here's a question. Who's the Johnny Orr? Who's the Johnny Orr option, if there is one? Okay, let me say first, and I, I may get there eventually. I actually don't know. I, can't, I don't think Scott's – I don't think the idea of Scott Frost coming to Lincoln, restoring – most of what worked before and infusing it with high end skill talent. I don't think that was a flawed blueprint. I don't either. I think it was a crappy execution. I do too. Okay. So I think we I think we need to be careful that that we don't confuse those two. I think right. Scott failed because his execution sucked. And he was too confident in his offense being able to create wins where they weren't able to do it. I think he, they ran into obstacles where they would mismanage games because they thought they could get a lead. Minnesota's the best example. Like, I think Scott came into the league and said, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to get leads and then we're going to create turnovers and we're going to win eight or nine games just doing that alone. And that wasn't true. He but did, they, but they These took, teams sat they, on the ball. They took a shortcut on the... <laughs> they did. They I took a, They took shortcuts. They, they didn't develop, especially on the offensive and defensive line, but, but they, did a, they didn't get solid in the little things. And I, I still think... That's what this person I was talking to was talking I about. Think is they're not good at that. These coaches aren't good at that. I think there's well, some truth to that. Yeah. Is Mike, really Gun- is Mike Gundy good at that? Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, it's hard I to say. Um, I, you know, he lost his defensive coordinator. We'll see. Uh, so who's the Johnny Orr? I think, I think he's better at that. than uh, It might be Mike Gundy. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the... Um, Johnny Orr, who, who's that? Who's let's that, let's let's who's update who, people who aren't on? fifty years old. Here. <laughs> who's that guy? Who you mean? Johnny Orr left the Michigan basketball program right. kind of at its peak. Mm-hmm. They were he was great there. He left on his own because I think somebody called him about the Iowa State job. Yeah, not related to him taking the who job. Who would you hire? Who goes, would you hire? How about well, what are you paying? I'm paying this. Hire me. I'm ready. I'll so Trev Alberts is calling around all these people, yeah. asking for their opinion. Mm-hmm. And who is the coach that you would you would think that guy might just be Johnny Orr? Oh he might just say, "Well, what about me for that job?" Uh, well, it's funny you say that because I think the the beauty of having this thing play out as long as it's going to play out is you're going to have guys like in the next two months, yes, where agents reach out to the search firm as opposed to the search firm reaching out to agents. Right. You know, there's going to be lots of times for, uh, you know, my, my guy isn't happy right now, and, is, and, and maybe James Franklin's that guy. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's a... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Boy, you I, have a name. I, I'm, I'm really, huh? You have a name. Somebody who's an established coach at another school who might be ready to move on. Well, we're talking about David Shaw. Mm-hmm. That's my I thought about him, and, and, and he falls into the category of he's hard on his luck now, but but boy, when he was going, that's what Nebraska wants. That, that, that kind of that, that kind of program. Um, I can think of another one too in the Big Ten. Um, go who? He's got a new stadium. Got to be oh well, yeah, <laughs> that's not happening. I Pat doubt Pitts. it. I agree. But that's his. That, that is, I, I know, I know he's uh, the AD's kind of guy, um, but yeah, the new stadium, he's done, he's staying there, uh, he, he can't leave that. Um, but I, that's a great question. I think Brett <laughs> Bielema is that kind of coach. Honestly, I think, I mean, whatever their ceiling is at Illinois, maybe he really wants to be there he, because he, he's from there. But man, if he like, cleaned up his act off off the field, yeah, you know what I mean. He's he's. Mm-hmm. He was a little wild at times. Yeah. Um, and, um, and well, he was at Wisconsin. And maybe yes. he has. Hey, you know who would be an interesting candidate? The head coach at Oregon State. Yeah, <laughs> he would. He'd be a great candidate. So I was talking to a, another. There's there's people who do consulting on Mike coaching R- hires. Mike Riley's old quarterback. Jonathan Smith is his name. And there's people who do consulting on coaching hires and things like that. And and uh, they 
helped consult with Nebraska, and uh, that's one of their favorite people. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and it's really hard because they're not they're not great yet, um, and they're probably not going to be any better than eight and four, or nine and three. But yeah, but that's a that's a a program builder, young guy who you could really you know yeah. get behind. Why not Chris uh, Peterson? What's he doing? I've heard, I've heard his name. What's he doing? He's a Pac-12 guy, man. He's a I don't know. They're gonna be a Pac-12 just... in five years. <laughs> They're gonna be a Pac-12 <laughs> to go to. <laughs> Is he gonna now? Yeah, I, 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 I can he develop probably. Oh yeah. But again, I want that offensive oh, line. Yeah. I want the offensive line to be. The he took priority. Washington it's from crap to the playoff in it's three pretty, years. It's pretty <laughs> overwhelming. Like just the the exercise. Is pretty overwhelming because Nebraska yeah. will be, because mm. of the timeline being as wide as it is, and because of the financial resources that Nebraska has, the the candidate list is almost endless. I mean, it's. I know we kind of felt that way when Riley was hired, you know, mm-hmm. like, but this is even I think even broader. Nebraska is going to be. They'll be they'll be in the conversation for for a lot of guys. Like I said, maybe maybe. I Anybody so outside of the top 15, 20 guys I'm, in the country. I'm usually not optimistic. I'm, I'm optimistic about this because I think they have the uh, – coaches want – they they want to know who's my boss, everybody on the same page, will they have my back, will, will I be supported. They have that in place. Um, and also want to know, can I win the league? Now, 14, it was going to be 16, it might be 20. Eventually, winning your league is not going to be important. It's going to be, am I getting in the playoff? But you, you, everything is in place here to do that. NIL is also, they're, they're going to take control of that. That's a big piece. Uh, if, 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 if you're selling this job, being able to say, we have control of the NIL, and, and it, it's all going to be uniform. It's all going to be organized. It's going to make sense. That's a big deal, too. So... Um, you have a fan base that's attractive for if, if you need transfers, come on in. We got NIL, and we got tr- we got fans. Right. So um, I want to talk about Aranda for a minute. Yeah, and there's a reason why I want to talk about Aranda. Um, Dave Aranda obviously is the coach of Baylor. Uh, he's 45 years old, uh, so he's my age, your age. Um, young cerebral guy. His name has been dropped two different times by the current interim head coach, um, who worked with Dave Aranda at LSU, and uh, whose current interim defensive coordinator is Bill Bush, who worked with Dave Aranda at multiple spots, three spots, actually, and whose current, or uh, whose former player personnel director is Vince Guinta and is currently at Nebraska. I'm not, I don't know what, I don't know what Nebraska's going to do there. I think is an intriguing option. Um, he's certainly done a lot of good things in the Big Ten. Um, he's, you know, like I said, there's a, there's a personality comportment there that's much closer to a Mike Riley than a Bo Pelini. He's kind of introverted. I think he would have a hard time doing the fishbowl here. But one of the advantages to a person like Dave Aranda is there's already an infrastructure in place and people who know the program that would be on the, cur- would be on the new staff. And that's interesting to me. I don't know what, I mean, my wife, attended Baylor for a while. We, we pay unusual close attention to Baylor. We get the alum magazine, all that. And what I will say is that there are advantages to being at a private school and there are disadvantages to being at a private school. At a private school, you'll never win a national championship uh, unless you're USC or Notre Dame. And, and lo and behold, they haven't done that in a while. Um, and Baylor is, it's in Waco and it is what it is. And you're not, there are very few coaches outside of one or two that are going to stay there forever. You know, even Kim Mulkey left Baylor to go to LSU. And so Dave Aranda is interesting to me because there are reasons why that transition would be smoother than other transitions. And wouldn't it be interesting? We've we've learned that Mickey Joseph is very persuasive. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> Maybe as persuasive as anybody Nebraska's had as an assistant coach in a long time. Uh, sells the program, sells himself, high character, you know he's he's the reason Casey Thompson's here. He's yeah. he obviously uh, he obviously impressed Trev Alberts. Wouldn't it be interesting if Mickey Joseph played a role in in recruiting well, the, Dave Aranda to Nebraska? Well, the next guy would be smart to keep uh, keep Mickey on for at least a year or so. Well, I agree um, with that. I mean the, the the high school coaches, especially in Omaha, will love him, and um, I mean he he could really pave the way for a year or so to uh, you know, but. 
obviously the next guy would would have, would have to be secure. I, think about Mickey. He's not a Frost guy. He's not, you know, he's he's he's, he's not going to sabotage anything. He's not going to try to. No, but he, he he wants to be a part of this. I, I'm, I'm I don't saying, think he wants to leave in December. No, but I'm saying if you're the next head coach, they're 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 very paranoid about keeping people on who who okay they. they He's going to be loyal to the last guy. Who you got think fired. Matt Campbell would do that? I don't think Matt Campbell would keep anybody. I think it'd be. I'd be I being, agree. I think it'd be Matt Campbell. Although you. I don't, I don't know Campbell, but but I'm going back to Randa. I think he's not going to stay at Baylor the rest of his no. career. He's no. got he's got places to be. I think. Um, but his next job might be Texas A and M or LSU. Right. Not you know. Correct. And um, well, he turned down LSU. Well, I well, think. Well, maybe he wasn't ready yet. Maybe. Um, where does he see himself? The LSU and A and M are better jobs in Nebraska, right? Yeah, the players are right not, next door. You know, um, he, he knows the Big Ten. You know, he's but he's he does. He, he's been there. He's been SEC. He's been Big Ten. He's from California. Um, what about Dave Aranda's head coach? Tom Herman is OC. DC is, I guess, Bill Bush. Mickey's the lead are, recruiter. Are we are we doing this now? Is Jason Peter the defensive line coach? No, yeah. I didn't say that. I mean, Tom Herman and Dave Aranda were on college. Rangers. I know. I'm just saying, here's my point, is that, like, you want to talk about, you're right about Mickey. I think it would keep him on a new staff, too, but I don't think every coach would do that. I think Matt Campbell would be like, I'm bringing my guys. Right. And they're my guys, just like Scott. I see Campbell like I see PJ, in, in a way. But. Yeah. PJ would be bringing his guys. There's, and I don't think PJ's going to do he it. He doesn't have oars. He's got black. Right. We're wearing all black. And he's got some saying. Oh, well, let's see him do that in Nebraska. We're wearing all black. <laughs> People don't really like that. They might, but, the, but my point being about Aranda that it's an interesting, intriguing option because of the smoothness of the transition. The question is, can you pay him enough, and can you deal with? Does he want the job? And and what are the what are the things that you've got to shape around him? When Trev said, and we're not necessarily going to win the press conference. My first thought, I'll be honest, was Chris Kleiman because <laughs> he doesn't win any press conferences. But my second thought was Aranda. I am going to uh, I'm going to let you guys um, close it out. Oh, by you're, talk- are you seriously going to no, put this on a tee? You're going to make us do this? No, I'm going to I'm going to tee it up. We'll talk for a minute, and then I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I got to get out of here by about 11:15. So now here's here's the thing. I'm ready to go as well. <laughs> Nebraska basketball. <laughs> are we sure we can't table this? We could table it, but I think I, you had some comments before the podcast that oh, I thought God. were interesting. So Fred Hoiberg, I thought seemed kind of better on Tuesday, a little energized. Um, and he's, he's talking about playing tough and ugly and all this other stuff. He's changing the format of the Husker Hoops opening night where they're not going to do a glorified all-star game, but they're going to do you know a, a, an open practice. I think he's pressing fundamentals. I think last year, I, I know, I know last year ticked him off to the max. Like, and I don't just mean he was disappointed, but like, what is this crap show? I think he was really <laughs> frustrated with, with the team that had been we're assembled. Used, we're used to it. We, were, we weren't we were phased at all. So do you buy any of this? Do you buy, do you buy that Nebraska basketball, um, with the schedule they have, are going are gonna to tough it out and get 14 I believe it when I see it. That's all I'll say. I, I, don't, I know. It, it's, it's hard to change the stripes right in the middle of it. He's never been that coach. I mean, Iowa State was – was all beautiful basketball, and they they, they, they they were playing a style before anybody else played it. Um, now, I, now a lot of people do that, but um, and he had a superstar, and um, you know, he had a superstar last year that he wasn't able to keep and, and develop, and but that's how that goes. That's fine, but I'll believe what I see. I, I don't think, I don't think there's been a coach. Who has disappointed me more? In th- this is true. In thirty years of watching Husker athletics, and that's saying something, right? It is. Like that's that includes Scott Frost. I don't think there's been a coach who's disappointed me more, and all the little things that Nebraska was so abysmal at a year ago and the year before, uh, that stuff is just that's ingrained now. I don't think I, <laughs> it's great. I don't think you can change it. Okay, it it, it is who they are, um, and 
I would be happy to be shocked. I'd be happy to be wrong, yeah. to be dead wrong. Nothing would, nothing would uh, please me more than yeah. to be dead wrong. And I, I mean, heck, I'll jump in the Missouri River if they win eight, do eighteen that. games. But yeah, take don't, something don't else. Do but the <laughs> point, the, the point <laughs> is, these identity shifts. You got to eat one of those spicy chips. This is what guy. This <laughs> is one what, chip challenge. This is what guys say when. When, when situations are not good, right. and uh, there, my my skepticism, like Tom's, could not be higher than it is right now. I feel like my sense of humor matches Fred's. He's pretty. He's much drier. I than love me. Fred Hoiberg, by the way. Right. <laughs> I just. But like, I, I can't stand the, his basketball. The teams. things that he said on Monday or Tuesday were just funny because he. I'm like, I know exactly what he means when he says it just turned into a glorified ulcer. And I'm like, yeah, it did. <laughs> like what. Is this what you want? Like, and I think he just got a little NBA eyes, so so to speak. He was a little bit too much NBA, and I think what I would say, and I'm again feel very confident about saying this, is that Bryce McGowan's, who was on the team last year, was the equivalent of a Hollywood actor who puts in a very good performance on, a, on in a movie that's not very good, and his his performance did not ultimately bear much on the success or failure of the movie or the team. Like it was just over here. I, I just I don't think Bryce was right. very well was very well part of, of of the overall winning effort. I think it was let's try to win a game and then simultaneously we have this parallel track where we help Bryce. What drives me they weren't the same. What drives me crazy, and it did as early as the NC State game last year, is it was almost like there was more pride in Bryce's development. That's right. Than there was in actually winning freaking basketball I know. games. Like get a stop. Okay. Yeah. How much? Of and that it, instead, was, it was yeah. some of that was driven by the media. After NASA too. I mean, it was. It, it was wasn't was was driven by me. No, it wasn't. And it wasn't driven by you. No. But forget all the little caught th- up in how Bryce was doing. Forget yeah. all the little things of you know, are we winning games or not? It was. Oh, Bryce could be a first round draft pick. Oh, Bryce leads the Big Ten in scoring. Oh, Bryce is all freshman team. Yeah. Who gives a crap? Okay. <laughs> like win a freaking basketball game. I know. And it would sure be nice if Nebraska would start doing the little things that uh, add up to winning basketball What did games. they do at the end of the year? They, they, they started doing something Well, right. Bryce got hurt. Yeah. And Alonzo, oh, maybe Alonzo Verge went off. Oh, that's not. I, I don't want to be rude to Bryce. I like Bryce. He's a good yeah. kid. But, um, no. but the point is, at late in the season, I think they finally started doing what they were supposed to be doing, and they ran the team through the point guard instead of instead – of, on this possession, we're going to hand it off to this person to try a shot. Like it was your turn, my turn, his turn, my turn, his no turn, question. your turn. It was yeah, it wasn't it wasn't I, team basketball. It, it was the it was the antithesis of what Creighton did. Fred's a very smart guy. He knows what to what, what needs to be done, mm-hmm. but he's never done that that way. So well, I don't think. So he's had teams that I think played quite quite well together in this right. one. I think the idea is they don't have a star on this team and maybe they'll play well. I don't know. I don't know. You um, you had to set me up for that, okay? I wasn't going to go there. I didn't need to go there. It's September 29th, whatever it is. They started practice and today. And you so. prodded us That's into why talking to Husker Basketball. That's why you two should have a show. <laughs> All right. I'll leave it on that. That is the Pick 6 Podcast for this week. Remember to subscribe to on the Omaha World Herald, omaha.com backslash subscribe. Thank you for listening. Husker fans, we'll be back next week to recap the Indiana game, which we just did not talk about for per- on purpose. And look ahead to the trip to New York City and Rutgers. Thanks, Oscar. Fans.